Good afternoon, everyone, and on behalf of the Friends of the Village Library of Cooperstown, welcome to the fifth of the Sunday Speaker Series for 2020-2021 with David Brower and Sean Pearson and their presentation, What Will We Eat in a Climate-Changing World? My name is Leanne Hirabayashi, and I'll be co-moderating the session with Maureen Murray. Thank you all for joining us. Let me go over a few items related to logistics and format for this session. There will be a couple brief messages from the host and sponsor, after which I'll introduce our speakers who will make their presentations. Then we'll have a question and answer session, which will be handled by my co-moderator, Maureen Murray. For attendees, and it looks like we're up to um, just, it looks like about 15 uh, of you. Um, at the bottom of your Zoom window, you will see several icons in a bar similar to what I'm showing here. Please note that uh, chat is disabled and we are not going to be using that raise hand feature, just the Q&A tool. If you have a question, please click on that Q&A icon and send it in at any time. Maureen will be monitoring the Q&A tool and asking questions on your behalf. And um, please note that we may not be able to get to everyone's questions and uh, thanks for your understanding about that. Finally, um, the programs in the Sunday Speaker Series are being recorded and a link to each recording is made available on the Friends of the Village Library webpage. We do have one exception, which was last month's uh, recording could not be posted due to proprietary information on these slides. The Friends of the Village Library works closely with the library to sponsor educational and education entertaining programs for the Cooperstown community. We'd like to take a moment to thank our former library director, David Kent, for his 22 years of service and welcome the new director, Heather Ertz, who begins her tenure on April 21. The annual Sunday Speaker Series is one way that the Friends of the Village Library fulfills its mission by hosting a slate of monthly programs, usually scheduled from October through May. Each year, this series features a diverse group of speakers on topics that have included local history and geology, healthcare, and discussions with local artists, authors, and, journalism on, and journalists on issues of the day. The League of Women Voters of the Cooperstown area is grateful for this opportunity to sponsor the Friends of the Village Library Sunday Speaker Series with its goal of providing educational programming to the community. Serving the people of the Cooperstown area, including the village of Cooperstown, the towns of Otsego, Middlefield, Springfield, and Hartwick, and surrounding towns in northern Otsego County, we are a nonpartisan political organization. The League of Women Voters encourages the informed and active participation of citizens in government and works to increase understanding of major public policy through education and advocacy. To find out more, please go to our website, lwvcooperstownarea.org. And now let's move on to today's program with brief introductions of our speakers. David Brower is Dean and Professor of the School of Business and Hospitality Management at the State University of New York at Delhi, where he has received the Chancellor's Award for Excellence in Teaching and been honored as Academic Advisor of the Year. Prior to his 20-year career in higher education, David held management roles at several organizations, among them the Walt Disney World Resort and the Cooperstown Country Club. He serves on the Board of Directors for the New York State Hospitality and Tourism Association and is Board President of the Oneonta Dollars for Scholars chapter. David holds associate and baccalaureate degrees in hospitality management from SUNY Delhi, an MBA in hospitality administration from Johnson and Wales University, a PhD in organization and management from Capella University, and is also a certified hospitality educator. Chef Sean Pearson is associate professor of culinary arts and hospitality management at SUNY Delhi. He has had a distinguished career in industry, including executive chef at chef positions at several restaurants uh, and clubs, including Jack's Oyster House in Albany. Sean serves as the advisor to the SUNY Delhi student chapter of the International Food Service Executives Association. He has coached team and individual competitors who have achieved student chef of the year and the young chef national champion. Sean holds a baccalaureate degree in culinary arts from the Culinary Institute of America, is a certified executive chef and a certified hospitality educator. This afternoon, 
David and Sean will speak on what will we eat in a climate changing world. So now I'm going to end my slideshow and stop sharing my screen. And uh, David, if you haven't unmuted yourself and started your video, please do so and take it away. Very good. Thank you very much, Leanne. Uh, and thank you all for joining us today. Uh, Chef Pearson and I are very excited to have an opportunity to, uh, to make this really timely and important presentation. Um, and with that being said, I sound like I'm taking credit for, for some of the, uh, the content that you're going to be hearing today, but uh, Chef Pearson is certainly the expert in this field. And uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be here to, to tell you a little bit more about SUNY Delhi and uh, the programs that we offer. Uh, and to provide you with some background and some context. So as we proceed on to the next slide, just a couple of uh, bits of trivia about SUNY Delhi. But we like to say that hospitality at SUNY Delhi is a, is a, is a tradition. We have been uh, in existence in our current form since about 1957. Uh, Delhi as, a, as an institution started out as an agricultural and technical college uh, and over the course of the years, transitioned into uh, a College of Technology, which is what we, what we currently are now. Um, we were the first SUNY institution uh, in our sector, in the College of Technology sector, to offer a baccalaureate degree, uh, and that bachelor's degree was in hospitality management, so we're very proud of that. We, at this point, are still the only institution that offers um, a bachelor's degree in, uh, I'm sorry, in um, event management, and we're the only institution that offers a uh, bachelor's degree in culinary arts and hotel and restaurant management. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. We're super proud of the fact that our graduates are working not only all over New York State, but all over this wonderful country and the world. We continue to be uh, a leader in applied and experiential learning, which you're going to hear a little bit more about during my portion of the presentation. And Chef will also be kind of underscoring that as he goes through his elements. Um, but we, we're very proud of the fact that we're, that we're actively involved in educating future chefs and managers within the hospitality industry. So, and of course, we're very happy to be here today to, uh, to share that message with you as well. Um, as I mentioned before, our institution offers predominantly uh, two and four year academic programs, although we do have uh, a cadre of certificates and three master's degrees at this point as well uh, in other areas and other disciplines. But in the hospitality management program, we have associate degrees, two-year degrees in hotel and restaurant management, uh, event management, and of course, culinary arts. We also offer a baking and pastry advising track currently, uh, but we have submitted a uh, program proposal to SUNY to pull that out as a standalone degree as well. On the baccalaureate level for four-year degree programs, we offer, again, the same uh, concentrations in hotel and res restaurant management. Uh, event management and culinary arts management. Um, our baking and pastry is offered as a, an advising track currently, but again, we've applied for uh, a standalone program in that regard as well. Our programs are offered both on ground and online, uh, the bachelor's degree. Uh, we also have a partnership with uh, SUNY Schenectady in the Capital District where we offer our baccalaureate degrees on their campus. So we're very proud of the, the programs that we have uh, that we offer. With that being said, we like to say that our students fall into all of these categories. They're professional, they're involved, they're knowledgeable, they're well-recognized, they're ready to jump into the workforce, so they're employable and they're prepared. So I'm gonna go into, the, into a little bit of details on each one of these as we proceed on today. So for professionalism at SUNY Delhi, these are some of the points of pride that we have in relation to uh, providing high quality education to our students. First, we require that students attend certain classes and presentations made by guest speakers and anytime we go on field trips, we require that they wear professional attire, so interview attire, kind of like what I'm wearing now. And we think that that helps to make them as professional as possible when they embark on their careers in the hospitality industry. In our culinary labs, we have students wear uh, appropriate chef's uniforms. And now the chef uniform at Delhi uh, is a really sharp looking um, it's a sharp looking outfit, which you'll see in just a moment with Chef Pearson, uh, but our students are required to wear an appropriate chef hat, um, a logoed chef coat, um, black and white check pants, shoes, appropriate shoes, and an apron. And ultimately, as we, um, as we get these students into the classroom, at first they're a little apprehensive, but then they get really excited about 
having a pride in that, uh, in that nice crisp white jacket that they're wearing and that, that wonderful uniform. Um, our students, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in a coming slide, but our students are all required to complete a professional work experience. Now, typically that takes place, the required one at least takes place the summer between the first and second years. So students have the opportunity to go out and work in industry. Um, and as Leanne had mentioned, um, I was also a student at SUNY Delhi, and I did my professional work experience at the Cooperstown Country Club. So I, I think some of you are probably pretty familiar with that facility. Um, so that place holds a very uh, you know, soft spot in my heart. Uh, and then lastly, but certainly not least, one of the things that we're extremely proud of is the fact that we have our students participate in an etiquette dinner. So we have a, a professional etiquette coach who comes to campus and who teaches uh, the basic elements and the fundamentals of, of etiquette, business etiquette. Um, from dining to attire, et cetera. So it's a really great event. Our students are also very involved, not only on campus, but in, our, in the greater Delhi community and across the state. Um, one of the things that we're really extremely proud of are the student trade organizations or the clubs that we offer on campus. So as you'll see here, we have six, currently we have six uh, distinct clubs and organizations that operate through the hospitality department. The first three, Meeting Professionals International, the International Food Service Executives Association, and Club Managers Association of America are all sanctioned student chapters. So they're, they're organizations that operate out in industry. So these students are getting exposed to the types of professional affiliations that they'll need to have to be successful once they get out into industry. Our Hotel Management Society, the Delhi Escoffier Club, and the Patissier Club are all um, based right on our campus. Um, so again, they have opportunities for networking and scholarships, internships, permanent placement. So all of the important things that a professional organization provides to its membership, in this case, at the student level. Um, we're in the process of looking at kind of retooling this and, and kind of putting it all under one umbrella of a hospitality club, but still students will, all will definitely have access to each one of those different organizations that I've just described. Um, from departmental involvement, our students are really engaged. They have the opportunity to participate in a number of competitions. Uh, some of you have probably read in the newspaper about some of the wonderful things that our students have done, uh, not only on campus, but out in the, uh, in the culinary competitive world. Um, and Chef Pearson has been very involved in that process. He served as a, as a coach, as Leanne has, uh, has noted. But our students have won through the American Culinary Federation a number of different uh, state championships, uh, regional championships, national championships, um, both in the team capacity as well as the individual capacity. We hold two national records. So we were uh, the number one hot food team in the country, both in 2010 and 12. And we've also won the, the, uh, the accolade for the student chef of the year two times as well. We've uh, gone international and, and chef has been involved in that as well. Uh, we. Uh, participated in the Copa Culinaria Mundial Junior uh, competition. It's the Young Chefs competition. Uh, and we won both in Costa Rica and in Chile. So again, great, great accolades. Last but certainly not least in this category, uh, we've been involved with, um, with some local competitions. So you may have walked down Main Street in Oneonta and you may have seen uh, the gingerbread houses that our gingerbread team has, has created in the past, over the past the last 10 years or so, or so 10 or 12 years. Uh, they've won best in show and first place uh, for, for their gigantic gingerbread houses that they've created. And uh, one other thing really quickly there, um, we've also been involved with Kano, uh, the arts organization in Oneonta, where we've done the, uh, the chili bowl. And of course, that's been a delicious, uh, delicious event. And our students have, have brought home, again, uh, first prize each year that they've participated there. So we're excited to be involved here locally, as well as on the national and international stages. Um, we, we're very proud of the fact that, um, that we have a number of different uh, opportunities for our students to learn. After all, that's what they're, that's what they're at SUNY Delhi for. Um, kind of the, the, the biggest factor and the, the largest influence in, in all of that learning on our campus, of course, is our wonderful faculty. Um, you have the opportunity today to hear from, uh, from one of our best, in my opinion, one of our best chef instructors. Uh, but we have a, a number of faculty. We've got 12 full-time faculty that teach at SUNY Delhi and provide academic advisement to, uh, to our students. Um, and we're very fortunate to have them because they all bring a, a real wealth of industry experience to the classroom. 
Our uh, culinary arts program is accredited through the American Culinary Federation, an organization that I referenced just before. They're, uh, they are the leading organization, the leading association uh, for uh, chefs and for uh, culinary education in, in the United States. And uh, our, at our last accreditation, we're very proud to, to report that we um, earned a full seven-year accreditation with um, an exemplary status. We're only one of two uh, culinary programs in all of New York State to have that exemplary status. So we're extremely proud of that. I'm extremely proud of the faculty and, and all the hard work that they do to bring us to that level. Uh, we have very well-appointed classrooms and laboratories on our campus. We operate out of three buildings. Um, our Alumni Hall Hospitality Center has two commercial kitchens. We have 2,500 square feet of meeting space. We have an executive conference room, two operational hotel suites, and a um, it's kind of a, we call it our bar and beverage laboratory, but it's a, it's a fully operational bar and lounge. Um, McDonald Hall is our sister building on the main campus. And in that space, we have two fundamentals classrooms. We have a demonstration classroom with tiered seating and um, technology, lots of technology so that faculty members can provide demonstrations of techniques and so forth. And then we also have a dedicated baking laboratory. Uh, and our baking lab is is a is a great place to go when you're uh, when you're having a down day and you want to you want to get some sweet treats. Uh, again, there's always a student there who's who's willing to cheer you up with some sweet treats. Uh, and last but not least is our Bluestone Restaurant and Events Center. Bluestone Restaurant and Events Center is uh, is our newest facility. Um, it opened in the fall of 2019, and again we. It, Unfortunately, due to the pandemic, we've had to uh, had to pause our use of that facility, but we're looking forward to going back in uh, in the fall semester. This is a newly renovated establishment um, with event space as well as a more of a casual dining area and a state of the art kitchen. So our students have the opportunity to learn on some of the most cutting edge equipment and technology. We like to bring our students out into the workforce and bring them out into the industry through field trips and also bringing in industry guest speakers. Um, of course, the, uh, the pandemic has created some challenges, but one of the things that we're trying to leverage here as a silver lining to all of this is the accessibility and the availability of industry speakers to come into our classes, utilizing functions just like Zoom, like we're doing today. Lastly, we have a very active advisory board that is comprised of a number of different individuals from across the, across the industry. So again, they advise us and they also advise uh, the students as to what they need to be doing once they embark on their careers. So from the faculty standpoint, they provide all of us with the, um, the tools necessary to ensure that we're teaching content that's relevant and that's appropriate to prepare students for the workforce. So, and as we, as we round out some of the discussion here, the recognition, we like to think that we are uh, strong at recognizing our students for not only academic achievement, but also civic engagement, both on campus and in the greater community. Um, again, we offer a, a nice array of departmental and college-wide scholarships just for our department. Uh, for instance, last year, we were able to award almost $30,000 worth of scholarships to our students. Um, and again, given the demographic of student that we work with, that's a, that's a really important bit of uh, financial support. Um, unfortunately, the last couple of years, uh, this award that I'm just going to describe has been on hiatus, but uh, the Robert C. Seibert Emerging Hospitality Leader Award is a, an intensive week-long internship and shadowing experience that a student wins. Uh, it's a, given to a senior student um, who's committed to uh, not only bettering the industry, but who's also demonstrated leadership and, and success in, in and outside of the classroom. Um, and that, that award is, it sends the student to a number of different locations. Our most recent one uh, was at a, uh, was part he participated in a, uh, in a cruise. Um, and then we all, we've also sent people to um, Lake Tahoe and to Bermuda and Bermuda, uh, let's see here. We had one student who went and uh, was at a, a prominent hotel in London and then sailed back on the QE2. So again, we've had some, some great success there. We also have a, a really nice student of the month recognition program um, that we're proud of. And of course, we are able to engage many of our students with special projects and jobs, not only within the department, but across campus. So we're very proud of that ability to recognize our students. And then one of the most important things that we, that we talk about here related to 
translating education into students' ability to earn jobs is again, what can we do to make sure that we're connecting those dots? So as I've mentioned to you before, we have a professional work experience requirement on our campus. So students are required for one summer to work in industry, but we strongly encourage that they work in industry every single summer to build their experience and to expand their resume. Um, we, do, uh, we do not necessarily host a, um, a job fair, but we have what are called employer spotlights. And these are sort of a decentralized job fair where we in invite employers to campus they present in specific classes, and then they set up an information table in the Alumni Hall Hospitality Center where they're able to meet with students on a one-on-one -on -one basis, and in many cases, interview them and make, them, uh, make offers to them. Uh, so again, we do a lot of recruitment right on our campus. We offer career preparation that's sort of infused throughout our curriculum from our orientation class all the way to our senior seminar course. Uh, so students get that career preparation at multiple stages along the way. Um, in addition to that, we have a, a career services office on campus that's very engaged. We like to think that we have, you know, tremendous contacts in the in, in the industry, and of course, we have we create lifelong contacts and provide that lifelong assistance for our students and graduates. One of the things we're extremely proud of, though, is that all of our graduates, 100% of our graduates, leave SUNY Delhi with practical work experience. Um, they have they've been in the industry. They've They've, they've cooked on the line, perhaps, they might have expedited, they may have worked in the front of the house, um, or they've worked in hotels or in event centers. So they go out there knowing what it's like to be a professional in the industry. So we're extremely proud of that. So as I conclude my portion of the presentation today, we like to think that SUNY Delhi prepares our students to join the workforce. In many cases, our students are uh, leaving the, uh, the classrooms and they're graduating and they're jumping right in with both feet, whether that be in uh, supervisory positions or entry level uh, management roles in, in the hospitality industry. In addition to that, we, we're very proud of the fact that many of our students are completing four year degrees at this point. When we first started in the 1950s all the way up into the 1990s, um, we only offered a two year degree on our campus. So we're extremely proud of the fact that we've been able to expand that to, uh, to baccalaureate programs. So a majority of our students do stay on with us for baccalaureate degrees. Some do transfer, but most of them have stayed on with us. Now that we offer a four-year program, we are also seeing that students are leaving our, our four-year program and going into graduate level uh, study as well. So some of our students have even gone on to become chef instructors or um, have gone on to be research chefs and so forth that require some advanced academic training. We also work with non-traditional students who are very interested in making a, a change in their career, or maybe this is a hobby that they want to turn into a business. So we're, we're pleased to be able to work with uh, that population of students as well. But in all of these capacities, we're extremely proud of the fact that we help students follow their dreams. So again, this is a, a bit of information that we have related to the hospitality management program at SUNY Delhi. Um, we'll certainly Field any questions that you might have towards the end, but uh, I don't want to take up any more time because I don't want to steal the show from, uh, from Chef Pearson. I think you folks are in for a real treat today. Uh, Chef Sean Pearson has been at SUNY Delhi for uh, just about 10 years, I guess, at this point, and uh, he's, he's a tremendous asset to our program. He's one of our, as I mentioned to you before, he's one of our best chef instructors. Uh, he's, he's a a real solid academic advisor, a wonderful instructor, and works hard to create relationships with our students. And um, so I couldn't be more proud of him as a professional. And again, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to, uh, to Chef Pearson. He'll take the presentation away. You're in very good hands. Thank you again for having us today. Thank you so much, Dr. Brower, I appreciate that. Um, welcome, I'm very excited to be here today. This is something that I'm very passionate about is climate change and food and the foods that we're gonna eat moving forward. So what I've done, I've prepared a, a small slideshow, but I really kind of want this to be about a Q&A that we can kind of get into moving forward in the end. So I think one of the first things that we need to address, and I, I know that we all know quite a bit about it, but exactly what climate change is and how it can affect us. Climate change, when we look at it on the grand scale, is the changing in the Earth's temperature or the changing in essentially bodies of water rising and things of that nature. 
it pretty much when we look at it in the last 100 years, the Earth's temperature has gone up one degree kind of across the board. And that doesn't seem like a large amount, but in the big scale of things, as far as farming goes, as far as growing seasons goes, that definitely plays a tremendous part in, in what we're going to eat moving forward. Uh, the weather can change in a few years, but climate change definitely, or I'm sorry, the weather can change in a few minutes, but climate change takes a few years to actually take place. Um, a lot of the climate change, which I'm going to talk about, is things that, that we have done as a society, and a lot of it are just naturally occurring things. So we're going to kind of take a look at each of those. Um, so some of the causes that we see, and again, fossil fuels we all know about. Fossil fuels is essentially the, the CO2 that we're putting into the, into the climate. Deforestation we're going to talk quite a bit about and increasingly intensive agriculture. You never really take into account that agriculture and how we actually grow our crops and how we treat our land is a cause of climate change, but we're definitely gonna talk a little bit about that. We're gonna talk about uh, volcanic eruptions, sun's intensity and changes in naturally occurring greenhouse gas concentrations. Um, essentially, when you look at it, a volcanic eruption, you have CO2 that's emitted into the atmosphere. You also have uh, the sun's rays, which are being blocked. So we don't really take that into account, but it's definitely a thing to, to consider when we're looking at climate change. Every American life pretty much produces three pounds of toxic chemicals into the air. So these are things that we want to try to reduce our carbon footprint, as well as try to kind of make for a better earth moving forward for everyone. The other issue we're going to talk about, how climate change affects food security. And again, food security, if you look at the slide, it really is, it's the physical economic access to food that essentially can help you to have a healthy diet, productive and healthy life. So it's very much based on the availability, access, the use, utilization, and stability of food. And in the next couple of slides, we're going to talk about what those really mean. Right now, in order to feed the population, which is expected to grow to over 9 billion by 2020, 2050, we'll have to double our current food production. And the issue with that is we're running out of healthy soil to really make that something that we can actually do. Um, some of the preventative measures, which we're going to talk about towards the end of the slides here, are something that I think that as a society, we really need to take into account. So we've looked at climate control, we've looked at food security a little bit. Let's look at essentially what the, those things with food security relate to. So availability, the existence of food in a particular place at a particular time. You wanna make sure that everyone has the same availability to food. Now this is definitely something that has changed with the transportation, how transportation has evolved. Um, it's made people have a lot more access to obtain healthy foods. They want to have the utilization, the ability to use and obtain nourishment from food. Just because you have food doesn't necessarily mean that that food is something that, we're, that holds nutritional value. Uh, you want to make sure that your food is not just, you're not eating just to have substance, you're eating for nutritional reasons. And one of the things that I'll talk about in the end is if we eat healthy, it'll kind of, it'll help us to make a healthier life as well as a healthier earth for everyone moving forward. And you wanna have stability in what you're eating. The absence of uh, fluctuation is something that we all kind of look at. You wanna make sure that people are, have all of these things combined, the availability to food, the access, the utilization, and essentially the stability to kind of have that food on a regular basis. So how does climate change and food security kind of go together? Climate change is something that's been affecting our food production. Um, it's affected the availability, the access, the quality, the utilization, and the stability of our food systems. It's really been, when you look at natural disasters that have, that have, had, that have occurred, excuse me, a lot of that has to do with climate change, whether it's a rising shore or whether it's the, the robust storms that come through our areas. They're all kind of affecting our food security 
through climate change. Extreme weather related disasters are increasing and they reduce the yields of major crops. If you were to look at uh, some farms that, that definitely have been successful in the past, there's three or four years in a row where they'll have too much water, not enough water. And then the soil just kind of starts to, to degrade when you have large amounts of erosion when, erosion when you have that water. And that kind of makes a double-edged sword where if we dig too much into our soil, you're just producing dirt. And we're gonna talk about kind of the differences between dirt and soil, but the higher levels of CO2 reduce the nutritional value of our crops. So this is all, all big things that we need to take into account when we're looking at how we're gonna plant our food and essentially where our food is gonna come from in the future. So the direct impact on agricultural production. Um, essentially what that's saying is if we reduce the amount of food, we're going to increase the actual prices of that food. So that's not something that, that we want to try to do. And this is global food. This is on a global system. So the next slide that I'm going to show you kind of shows every little bit kind of has to do with global food system and how global food packing goes. So if you look at this slide here, it can kind of show you this is our food system. All of these things that you see on here produce that CO2 that's getting into our air, whether it's disposing it, producing it, processing it, packing it, um, the actual wholesale retail and transportation and storage. So all of these things are really starting to affect our foods and our food systems. Some of the changes that we'll see, the changes that are going to occur, again, the change in precipitation. This has to do with a lot to do with erosion. It has to do with either not enough moisture or too much moisture. Changes in temperature. Right now, uh, where we are, you can see that our growing season has grown by about 10 days just because of the amount of actual warmer air that we're getting at this point in time. Uh, changes in pests and pest diseases. So, Insects and pests are definitely are good things and bad things. Um, if you look at the, the life cycles, you can see that a lot of different pests are come back cyclic, cyclically. So what we're looking at now is how that's affected by the climate change. Is it something where normally these pests would go down into the earth for the winter and they would be able to live down there? And now a lot of times it's, you're not getting that cold freeze where it's actually killing off the pests. So those are things that we're gonna definitely pay attention to moving forward. Uh, the last one that you see there, your sea level rise and storm surges. That's been huge. And you don't really think about that, but when you look at a sea level rise, you're gonna, we're gonna start to lose a lot of our ports. Uh, the ports are where a lot of our wheat is stored and whether it's this country or other countries, it's shipped and moved around. Uh, storm surges are huge and they're, the more a storm surge pushes in, the more it's going to affect essentially where we're growing and how we're able to get essentially new land to actually grow on. So when we look at our land, there's two things that we're kind of looking at. We have soil and we have dirt. Soil is alive. It really is. It's an important thing. And I know when I I work out in my garden with my kids. My daughter's like, oh, worms. And she wants to get them out of there. And that's one of the things where I have to kind of explain to her that, no, we want those in there. Soil is a living organism. You'll have worms, fungi, insects, bacteria, and organic matter that's in that soil. It's literally been decomposing in there since the earth was created. So our soil is a beautiful, beautiful thing. We have to be cognizant of our soil. And essentially, it sounds crazy to say, but our soil usage. We've lost one third of the Earth's topsoil since 1970s. A lot of that has to do with deforestation. It has to do with uh, not using sustainable measures when we're doing our farming. So what there are some things we're going to look at and how we can kind of round the bend and kind of come back to where we need to be. When you look at dirt, dirt is what's on kind of what's on top. Dirt's dead. It doesn't support life. Uh, you can't plant a productive garden with dirt. Dirt is essentially when you're working outside and you kneel down, what you get on your clothes is essentially dirt, where your soil is what you're digging into. 
So one of the things that we're going to talk about is how to prevent the soil loss, because that's an, a huge, huge thing moving forward in our world that we need to kind of pay attention to. Since we're kind of hurting our soil, we've used twice as much fertilizer now than in the 1960s. And one of those things that we kind of see doing that is, is rototilling. The more tilling makes for worse soil and the need for more chemicals. So what tilling does is it kind of, you're going across the land and you're digging underneath the land and you're digging into the soil. Yes, it's good because it turns things up, but what it does is it also kind of makes that top layer of soil lose all of its natural abilities. So you'll see with the new seed planting machines that farmers are using now, they're going much less deep into the soil. They're really just kind of taking it and they're going almost about two inches as opposed to deeper where they were in the past. And what this is doing is it's making for less of our soil underneath to kind of be, uh, to kind of get disrupted. Uh, so desertification is a process where fertile land becomes a desert as a result of drought, deforestation, or inappropriate agriculture. And that's kind of where we're at now. A lot of our farmlands that you see, if we don't treat them properly, what happens to them is that the soil really, and the, the pieces of land kind of start to, to lose all their nutritional value and to essentially die off. If we have strong soil, you're gonna have a plant and a climate connection where the plants are gonna really absorb all the CO2 that we have in our atmosphere. They're gonna bring it into them and then they're gonna put it back out as oxygen. So if we're able to have strong soil, we're gonna have that awesome plant and climate connection. <clears throat> Excuse me, some of the things that I think are really, really neat that we have right now that a lot of people are doing. One of them is regenerative, ag regenerative, regenerative agriculture, excuse me. Uh, so you see this both with farming and with ranching. This is something, this is a, a proactive measure that we can use to reverse climate change. So essentially what this does, if you are, if you are, if you have a cattle farm, what you'll do, you'll have movable fences and you can move your cattle from field to field to field so that they are not constantly in that one spot. What that does is it's good to have them in that spot because obviously cows have, are natural fertilizer, but they also produce a lot of CO2 with their waste. Uh, eating the grass is a good thing. It gives the grass the ability to, to kind of grow back as well as release some of the oxygen that we have in there. So moving from pasture to pasture, it's become a process that really has, uh, you've seen the land grow back much, much stronger when you move from one spot to another. It, it's an unbelievable difference. And you see that a lot with farming now what, as well. You don't necessarily see a lot of farmers that are using the same fields for the same thing. And if they are, a lot of times, if you have enough land, it's really letting that certain field or that certain spot kind of come back and let it regenerate. It's an important, important thing. And I think that uh, moving forward, we're gonna see pretty much all of our, our farmers and agriculturists move towards that regenerative agriculture. Um, we really need to repair what we've done. And this is one of the steps that we can kind of do. I spoke about the tilling, uh, the tilling and the lower dig and industrial planting. Those are huge measures that a lot of farmers have seen moving forward. Because if you're a farmer, that's your, I mean, proprietarily, you make your living off of the planet and your earth. You want to make sure that you're setting yourself up for success and that the spot of land that you have, you can make the most successful things out of that one particular spot. And a lot of that reverts back to your agricultural uh, regeneration. Uh, bio sequestration. This is a way that essentially, this is the capture and the storage of atmospheric greenhouse gases, essentially making them come into the plants and then turn them into CO2 and come out into the, or I'm sorry, into oxygen and come back out into our planet. So this is one way that we can fix our CO2 issues is by bringing it really 
bringing it back into our earth and bringing it back into the soil. This is something that can heal the soil. And at the same time, while we're healing our soil, we can definitely concentrate on healing our climate, which is, I think, something we definitely need to pay attention to moving forward. Um, one of the last things that I'm going to kind of touch on is upcycled food. So this is kind of, I don't want to say a newer trend, but this is a trend that's extremely interesting. Upcycled foods are foods that are made from ingredients that would otherwise have ended up in a food waste destination. One of the most popular things I can think of for this is hops. Uh, and Anheuser-Busch is someone that has, has definitely pushed the envelope with this. There's producers that are producing flour, actually, believe it or not, from upcycled food. So normally in the past, a lot of that product would be just gotten rid of. But now there's actually, uh, there's flowers and different products that we're using through upcycled food. It's really, it's about elevating the food to its highest and best use and getting that 100% use out of our food. Um, starting on Thursday for Earth Day, you're gonna see labels that are actually on your food if something is an upcycled product. So it's definitely awesome to see that we're moving in the right direction and we're actually marketing those things. You know, it was, it was awesome when GMOs, when they had to post that something has a GMO in it now, and I think this will be kind of the same thing going in the opposite direction where people will gravitate more towards something that is an upcycled food because of how it's really kind of gonna be restorative to our, our essentially our food cycle that we have. Um, they are fit for human consumption, but even a lot of it, uh, a lot of what we grow, I think it's an astonishing number, like 20, 28% of our agriculture doesn't necessarily go to what we eat. It goes to feed other animals and things of that nature. But moving forward, even some of the scraps that you're gonna see will be used for different types of pet foods and things of that nature. So I think upcycled food is really gonna help to feed our growing population without increasing the deforestation or essentially putting extra pressure on the environment. It's really using something that we already have out there and kind of using it again. It's very similar to what we see when we look at composting. And composting, I am an enormous proponent of composting. Um, a private club that I used to run in Big Indian, we would do composting. And it was amazing when I would take the students down and we dumped our local compost at the Frost Valley YMCA. At the beginning of the summer, you would see the piles and they would just be really, really big. You could watch the progression of the piles as the staff at the, the Frost Valley moved them down. And by the end of the summer, the largest pile was extremely small because it literally just kind of eats itself up and becomes uh, an awesome, awesome thing that we can use. We use it a lot in of our gardens and we use it a lot in our, uh, in our flower gardens as well as food gardens. Composting is amazing. Delaware County has uh, one of the best uh, composting setups that you can have. Uh, a lot of our food, it goes through and it goes through a conveyor. Plastics get sorted out. Food waste goes to one spot and the count and the, everything else kind of goes to Syracuse. So it's, it's awesome to do something like that. Through our establishments in the school, we try to really impress it on our students, both with our, with our campus dining program and in our laboratories. Uh, there is a local farmer that comes and picks up the local scraps. He uses it both, some of it to feed his animals, but a lot of it also goes into composting. Our food waste and what we do with it, again, that's huge. There is so much food waste in our country that if we make sure that we're using it for the proper things, making a compost out of it, or using it to kind of to share with our farmers if you're not interested in composting, it, it makes a huge difference. If we have healthy foods, it'll be better for us and it will be much, much better for our planet. And I think essentially that's kind of where we're at right now is trying to make sure that everything that we do and lessening our carbon footprint and making it better moving forward. It's not just right now that we need to look at, we need to look at 2050 and how what we do now can affect 
the food sources that we have in 2050. If we keep up with the rate that we're at, um, it's going to be it's going to be extremely hot and in certain areas, and our our growing is going to kind of really really reduce down. When you look at some of the scares from a a buyer's point of view, when you look at what's happened with lemons, limes, avocados, oranges, if there's a if there's a, a weather disaster, if you will, it affects everything. It affects the availability, it affects the price, and it affects the quality. And that all has to do with climate control and how we can really affect things moving forward. The last thing, again, Earth Day 2021. It's really important that we, I know we, uh, we kind of talk about it every year, but it's important that we definitely try to to do the right thing moving forward. Uh, we have one earth and we really need to make it, I think the best that we possibly can. Um, it's something that we really, we need to kind of spend a little bit of time and think about where we're getting our food from, where we're, what we're doing with our waste and our scrap. Uh, one thing that I've always impressed upon students is the, a farm to table culture. The, um, the private club that I ran, I really, I focused on it. That was our thing. We would talk to local purveyors, local farmers and reach out to them and see what we could bring in that would also help the farmer as well as provide a really, really awesome product for our guests. And that's, I think that's really something that uh, has become huge because it not only gives you a better product and supports your local community, but it also reduces your carbon footprint to be considered a local or a farm to table, it has to be about 150 miles from where you actually are. So where I was, it gave an awesome ability because I was located again, right in the Catskills. There are so many farms, whether it's beef, produce, dairy, that we're able to take advantage of. And I think that this area in New York, New York is one of my, my favorite areas to cook because especially in the summer, and in the fall, believe it or not, there's so many beautiful things we're able to get from our local gardens and farmers that I think it's a really awesome thing. I will, uh, that's kind of my spiel about everything. I'll definitely open it up to, to questions. I'm excited to hear what you have. Thank you, uh, Chef Pearson. This was, it's clear that you are not only knowledgeable, but you're excited about and passionate about what is happening in our future in terms of um, what we will consume and uh, how we will uh, shop, for instance. Um, I want to just remind all of our um, uh, knowledgeable participants to use the Q&A function to just uh, throw in your questions and I'll be your advocate in bringing them forward to both uh, Chef Pearson and uh, Dr. Brower. So um, we have a question already. Um, uh, the, indica the individual says that you mentioned, I think this is you, Chef Pearson, you mentioned that you have a garden. Is there anything that we can do in our own gardens that make it more environmentally friendly or less harmful to the environment? So some of the things that I do to really make my garden environmentally friendly is this sounds ridiculous, but where you source your soil or your fertilizer from, instead of going to a big box store and buying a plastic unbiodegradable bag of soil, try to reach out to your local farmer and see if your farmer can provide some, some actual compost or soil for you. We call it our, our magical poop uh, at my house because our farmer, he came down with a bucket and he brought us his, the, the soil and it's been absolutely unbelievable. Uh, to protect your garden from insects and things like that, we go all natural. We plant marigolds around, around the edges to prevent bugs because it, it's a natural deterrent for it. Um, obviously we don't use any sort of pesticides. One thing that, that we've used in our garden, and it, again, it sounds crazy. Um, I take hair from my, my dog and just kind of put it around the edges because I live in, a very, very wooded area, I guess you would say. So it really, it deters all the, the animals from my garden as keeping it as natural as you possibly can. Starting your own seeds in your house in the, in the winter is a really fun project that my, my children and I do. And then just getting out there, 
and really planting them and using the most natural soil that you can really find and trying to really keep it so that any type of deterrence that you have for either pests or bugs are all natural things. Good. This participant says this was a great presentation and that we're lucky to have you in our community. And I certainly agree. But let me just follow up on that hair thing. Does human hair, um, will that work, do you think? Uh, all of us who uh, are connected to some kind of hairdresser, now that we're able to get to the hairdresser, um, we could ask perhaps if it works for uh, her supply or his supply of um, human hair. That's yes, on definitely. That's an that's a great sustainable thing to do, and it definitely it's all about the oils that are in the hair and just the smell that the animals actually get, because obviously their olfactory is much stronger than ours. So once they kind of get near it and they smell it, it definitely deters them from mm -hmm. any type of. It sounds kind of crazy, but any type of hair is definitely an awesome natural deterrent. Okay, that's good. To, that's good to know. Um, I have a, a question about, uh, you know, what about now, today, tomorrow, this coming week? Do you, do you note uh, reduced yields or reduced quality in your own household search for food and in your academic profession, sourcing the food that you bring for your students to work with or learn from? So sourcing our food is something that we definitely pay attention to at the college. And I think one of the main things, believe it or not, is when we talk about our, where we get our proteins from and how we process those proteins. We have a really, really great relationship with local farms where we're able to bring in, whether it's uh, a side of beef or a whole hog. And that really, it, we work on that to reduce our carbon footprint, but it also gives the students the opportunity to break down an actual primal of whether it be a hog or beef. And it makes a huge difference. The quality is totally different. When you get uh, a pork chop from the store versus a pork chop that we, that we get from Riverdale Farms, it's an unbelievable difference. And the students definitely see it. Um, a lot of the things when we do a lot of our larger dinners, we focus on that farm to table aspect as well. There is an awesome, uh, an awesome place that Catsco Regional Harvest, where we're able to really use what they bring in through all local farmers and kind of present that to the students. You wouldn't believe how many students have never seen food in its most natural state. Like when you give them Brussels sprouts on a stalk, it, it's like their mind is blown. They don't realize how things actually grow. So we really, we focus on that quite a bit at the college just to really show them food in its, in its most raw and natural state. I think that's a really important thing for everyone to kind of see. Right, what a, what a superb uh, idea in terms of, I, I didn't recognize uh, Dr. Brower spoke about the college as having agricultural roots. I didn't know that actually. So you've essentially, I think, retained that. And it seems like you're doing farm to, farm to lab maybe in your classrooms. Is that correct? That you have established these relationships with your local farmers? It is, and it's, it's been amazing. The, uh, a lot of it we actually get in the fall because obviously our students aren't here in the summer. So they don't get to, to see the beautiful tomatoes that we're able to get. But fall vegetables in New York, I mean, it's, it's amazing the bounty that you're able to get then as well. I mean, the root vegetables and things of that nature have been unbelievable for them to see. Um, but again, a lot of the proteins that we get, the local proteins are, are unbelievable. And students, again, they have the experience to see the difference. When you put the two of them side by side, it makes a huge difference, whether it's a pork butt from Grenon Farms or a Hatfield pork butt. I mean, the, the difference is, it's huge difference in the marbling, which is the intermuscular fat. There's difference in the flavor and there's actually difference in the color as well. I see, I see. Here's a question related to seasons. Um, Chef, do you teach your students to focus on serving foods in season, for example, serving berries in the winter that are flown in from South America certainly increases the use of fossil fuels and is certainly not 
nearby farm to table. 100%. And we actually, seasonality is huge. And we talk about it as well, because when a, a strawberry is picked, so if you look at a strawberry in the winter, it has that little white, kind of white and green across the top. Strawberries are not picked in the winter time when they're in from for us in New York, they're not picked fresh. They're picked, they're sprayed, and then they're sent, and they don't necessarily ripen all the way. So you're getting a, not a mediocre product, but it's just definitely not the same. They're let to kind of to, to ripen on their way, if you will. Uh, so when you look at a strawberry that you pick fresh in New York in June, you look at it and it's that beautiful red all the way around because it's a, a locally fresh picked berry. Seasonality is absolutely huge. If you look at, I mean, we've, we've made leaps and bounds with when we're able to get things and that's been great, but the quality is definitely not the same. And we impress that on the students quite a bit. We, if they're gonna do a salad in the middle of winter, we try to press on, upon them the ingredients that they should use. Maybe this should be uh, a roasted beet salad as opposed to a caprese salad when you're using a tomato that doesn't have the same wonderful kind of flavors and colors that you would normally see. So we definitely, we stress seasonality very, very much at, at the college, as well as in our own kitchens, I think. Um, cyclic menus should represent seasonality. You shouldn't necessarily have a panzanella or a tomato style salad on the menu in a winter time, but in the, in the summer, it's, I mean, you can't go wrong with something like that in the summertime. Sure. Your, uh, your comments on upcycled food was uh, new to me in terms of making a new product. I am familiar with our local, some of our local grocery stores actually donating. I, I work in our local food pantry and um, the gross, local grocery store donates what we call fresh recovery. And it's products that look certainly quite good and they certainly are nourishing and still fine to eat, but the policy at the store says, take it off the shelf. Um, so that's been great for us because we are able to pass it on to our clients. But I want to ask you about um, changing our own selection behaviors in grocery stores or farmer's markets, you know, as our climate changes. And of course we're in it now. It's not like it's in the future, I don't think. So, I mean, should we be changing our behaviors and instead of deselecting an apple that has a small bruise, it's gonna be a lot of change for us, but what are your comments about that? I think definitely kind of like you're saying, if you don't pick that apple with the small bruise, it's gonna, it could go somewhere and not really be fully used. I think it all depends on the use and the utilization. So if you're serving that apple as a whole apple to someone, to your guests where you're making your fruit basket, I could totally see not using that particular apple. If you're making applesauce, apple pie, apple crisp, where you're gonna peel it and you can simply cut that one piece out, I think it's definitely something to look forward to because we all have to kind of do this together. So. And if we all make that, that concerted effort to really to work together and to kind of use up the products that, that need to be used, it'll make a huge difference. It, it definitely, uh, it's something that we need to kind of pay attention to, but just because something, there's a bad spot on it, if you're able to still use that apple, I mean, it's 100% it's something that I, I feel like you should do and you can kind of cut around it. Well, yes, and I'm thinking that if our food becomes um, more rare or we do not have the abundant supply that we enjoy now, we need to be strategic in selecting that bruised apple and finding ways to use to use it um, and not and not waste it. Um, and following up on on waste, if I were a student in your program, what would I be learning about food waste uh, as I work in your kitchen or my kitchen or someone else's kitchen? So the first thing that we look at as chefs, and I know this is going to sound unbelievable, is to really minimize minimize your waste as much as possible. You want to try to use every little bit 
of whatever the product is that you're you're using because that's where and we kind of say this in the in the classroom as a joke that's kind of where your bonus is going to come in as a chef is using whatever scraps and whatever you can out of every little thing if you waste the smallest amount you you bought that you brought it in the door and you've paid for it you want to try to get as much out of it as you possibly can whether it's if you're doing a roasted potato it's to peel your potato first cut your potatoes use the roasted potatoes and then use your scraps for your potatoes. I mean there's so many different parts in food waste that yes there are parts there are parts that you can't use but then that waste if you're peeling a butternut squash that skin from the butternut squash goes into it goes into your compost if you want that perfect dice the perfect dice goes into your roast everything that's left over goes into your butternut squash soup, which you, you make it, and then you have that on hand to kind of serve to your guests. So the, the full utilization of product and not having waste is something that we stress very, very much at, at the college, as well as every restaurant that, that I've been a part of. So your work at SUNY Delhi will actually begin to change the world as your students go out. Good for you. One small step at a time. <laughs> Um, I read with some dismay that in case of a significant disruption in the global food system, maybe related to extreme weather, the power grid, conflict between nations, um, there, there is no agency within the US government whose responsibility it is to take charge. Is that true? And would you comment on that? I would say that there, there really isn't anyone that is kind of taking the, the lead on this. And I think that's where we as kind of need to do our due diligence as people that are gonna need the food moving forward to really take the lead in this situation. It's really important that, that we look at the big picture of things. And I think not looking at the big picture and not having someone that's gonna really, I don't wanna say clamp down on us, but tell us the proper steps. I think that's where our, our public education of climate control and food security really need to be really brought to the forefront. I mean, the climate control is something that a lot of people are familiar with, but food security and food insecurity is something that a lot of people definitely aren't familiar with and how it affects different people, not necessarily always in this country, but even in other countries. It's, it's something that I, I think we, we could use a little bit more education and leadership on it 100%. Uh, do you recommend to your students and then to us um, action related to policy change? In addition to making sure that we do the right things with our soil and not tilling and using hair to be natural in our garden, what about the big picture? What about policy changes? What would you recommend? Reducing our carbon footprint as much as possible and really trying to make a policy that if you have food and you have food waste that can be used, whether it's at a public public facility or at a private institution, that that food waste is used to go somewhere. A lot of places have, have kind of a policy on, if you look at San Francisco, they have an awesome policy on compost and really the separation of things. And I, we kind of, I mean, years back, we had stronger policy, it seems like, on recycling and food waste and things like that. But I think that to have a policy on actual food waste and to make sure that everyone's kind of doing the same thing with it, to be able to, to have that compost go into back into our earth, I think was huge. The same thing, comp or regenerative, whether it's agriculture, whether it's farming or ranching, and really just working with farmers and almost having them have to move their cattle. I think, yes, it'll be a learning curve at the beginning, but the benefits for them moving forward would be huge. Superb. Um, I'm looking at the time and I think we have time for just this one last comment. Um, we talked about changing behaviors and what about reducing misconception as another way to reduce climate impact on food production? And what about the strategy of using fake, should I use that word fake, or plant-based meat 
brands. What is your assessment of those products? And do you encourage use of them? I, I do. I mean, uh, it kind of hurts me to say that I'm definitely a meat and potatoes person and I love a beautiful steak or a beautiful burger. That being said, people's lifestyles are changing and that plant-based lifestyle um, is something that a lot of people are moving towards. The, a lot of the plant-based burgers and, and meats of that nature, you really can't tell the difference. And, and Dr. Brower can attest to this. In my nutrition class, we made two different styles of meatballs because we went over and we were looking at a fat versus a plant-based meatball. And once everything was in those meatballs, it really, you really couldn't tell the difference between the two of them, a slight texture difference. But besides that, I mean, it, the plant-based meats that they've come out with have really been, in the past few years, have been incredible and given a lot of different people different options. Um, especially when you look at, so to, to kind of backtrack, yes, I agree with it. But that being said, I also agree with if you are going to buy meat, that it should be come from your local farm or mm -hmm. something that's kind of closer to you. Mm -hmm. it's going to reduce your carbon footprint. It's also going to reduce the amount of kind of the, the large wholesale meat packing industry in general, as we look at it, where they're not necessarily raised on green pastures. They're raised in spots where they're really kind of, they're, they're killing the soil because they're not moved around. And the, the large farming is something that, it's, it's a whole different issue. I mean, if when you look at the amount of CO2 produced by large farms and things like that as well. But to eat meat, yes, I'm all about it. I'm all about the local meat and getting as much as you possibly can. And that's what we do at the college as well. But the, the substitutions that are out there are really, really phenomenal now. It's uh, a vegan diet is something that you're able to, it's much more easy to sustain nowadays. And if, if we eat healthy, we're going to produce a healthier earth. Yes, thank you. And I see if just a few more questions, if you've got the, the time and tolerance. So clearly, it sounds like you do discuss the advantage of a plant-based diet with your students for the health. I mean, what are those seven, those seven words from, is it Michael Pollan, um, eat food, not too much mostly plant or something like that. Mm -hmm. So you, you teach your students about that. Yes. Um, okay. Um, what about dairy? Is there a way to get local products in milk or other dairy? Oh, yes. So, I mean, and that's become, that's become something that has really been awesome around, especially where we are right now. Clark's Farm has absolutely kind of due to the, the pandemic, believe it or not, has really expanded their, their local sales. Local dairy is huge. Again, it's all about supporting your local farmer. And what they've done in this area has really been amazing. And it's not just Clark's that does it. There's other areas. If you look at Fulton County, there's a Dysendorf farm down there, which has really supported the local community. But Clark's farm, kind of in general, that's where, that's where I go to get my milk. And it's awesome to drive there to pass the cows, to show my children the cows that the milk is coming from, to talk to Kyle who, who kind of runs things. Um, and the way that they do it, not to, to change the subject, but they have a sweeter milk and local smaller dairies can do this because when you produce milk and you're a large up or you're a large scale production, you wanna go as quickly as possible. So you bring that, you do your pasteurization extremely quickly. So you're heating it up as quickly as possible and you're killing all of your bacteria and it kind of, it takes away a lot of the flavor. What they do at Clark's Farm, they heat their milk up slowly and what that does is they're able to retain a certain level of sweetness in the milk. It definitely has a totally different flavor as well. And when you look at milks, obviously it all depends on what the cow eats as well. Right. Cow the milk has a different flavor because they are a grass-fed, finished with corn kind of cow. It's, it totally, it makes a difference in, in what they're eating and the way that they actually process the milk. I mean, my daughter, I can give her a cup of Clark's Farm milk next to a cup of, of uh, commodity milk and right away you can tell the difference, which is, it's really, really cool to see. 
Good. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to call in Leanne in a minute, but here's the final question. It's a sweet question, and, and if you could answer it briefly, what is the meaning of the pineapples behind you? Oh, Dr. Brower, I'm going to let you take this one. Okay, so the, the pineapple is the international symbol of hospitality, and it goes back to, well, the legend of the pineapple goes back to the seafaring days in New England when the captains would take their ships and sail off into, the, uh, into the, the West Indies and so forth, and they would come back with spices and rum. And one of the fruits that typically lasted the longest because of its acidity and its, its you know, tough rind was the pineapple. So the uh, seafaring captains, when they returned to New England, would spike a pineapple on their post outside of their home to indicate that they've returned safely and all were welcome to come in and enjoy the uh, the fruits of, of that captain's labor. So that, that is kind of in a nutshell, the, uh, the legend of the pineapple and how it became the symbol of hospitality. Oh, that's a, that's a good end to our wonderful presentations from Dr. Uh, and Dean uh, David Brower and Chef Sean Pearson. And I'll uh, call in Leanne then. Well, uh, thank you, David, Sean, and Maureen for just a great program today. Uh, I'll share my screen to tell you about what's coming up next month. So let's see. All right. So um, on Sunday, May 2, starting at 2 p.m. outside the Atsiko County Courthouse, uh, in Cooperstown, there will be an Atsigo rally for solidarity with Asian Americans to support and celebrate Asian Americans in our community and nation. And the rally will be about an hour long. It'll feature speakers, music, and more. So we hope you'll join us for that. On May 16, the 2021-2020-2021 uh, Friends of the Village Library Sunday Speaker Series, it ends its season with a program that coincides with the opening of the Keith Herring exhibit at Fenimore Art Museum. Chris Rossi, who's director of exhibitions at the Fenimore and Gary Casanelli, collector and owner of artworks in the exhibition will speak on Keith Herring, his art and times. And the Sunday Speaker Series are scheduled for 3 p.m. On, uh, on Zoom and they're free and open to the public. And participants can register for the Sunday Speaker Series um, by going online at fovl.eventbrite.com. And if you have any questions or comments, including any follow-up questions for the panelists today, um, please email fovlfriends22main at gmail.com. And I will stop my share. And I just want to thank everyone uh, for joining us today. And uh, we hope to see you on Sunday, May 2, and May 2nd, uh, or May 2 and May 16. Thank you again, and thanks everybody, and see you soon.